Hello, and welcome to today's session on what's new in Blackboard. Today, we're going to talk about our migration from our self-hosted servers to the cloud servers, and as well, talk about some of the new features that are available in the latest release of Blackboard that we've just moved to. So my name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Assistant Director in the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. And I'm grateful for all of you who are joining us today, as well as those of you who are watching the recording. So before we dig too far into Blackboard itself, let's talk about Blackboard here at NIU. We have a long history with Blackboard, and um, this latest upgrade is just one part of that. So in the fall 2017, which is the, the last semester that we requested any data for, we found that 97% of our students have been using Blackboard for at least one course. Now, whether or not students use Blackboard is dependent quite heavily, of course, on whether or not faculty are using it. So similarly, we see a high usage among faculty with 89% of our faculty, again, using Blackboard for at least one uh, credit bearing section. Uh, that's not the only way that we use Blackboard here at NIU. There are a lot of uses for supporting committee work and student organizations and the business of the university more broadly, but this at least represents the, the primary intended use of Blackboard, which is for uh, our four credit courses. Overall, that's about 73% of all course sections at NIU that have a presence within Blackboard. So that percentage has been increasing, although it has not increased dramatically. Um, in the last few years, we've kind of leveled out at 65 to 70 percent, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with similar usage across fall and spring semesters. Summer usage, honestly, is a little bit lower but as a percentage of courses, but that has a lot to do with the dynamic nature of summer courses. And then again, with faculty use, we're seeing overall, on average, around 90%, hovering a little over, a little under, but again, still very high usage. Uh, over the last 10 years, again, growing steadily and then kind of flattened out now. We did an interesting analysis, um, well, just over a year ago now where we looked at the specific tools used in Blackboard and looked at how many courses were using uh, various of those tools. And here, again, we see some, an overall increase. So it's not only in adoption of Blackboard overall, but we are seeing some increase in specific tools. Not every tool is increasing a lot, but most of them are increasing a little. Uh, and really interesting, the, the circles, the first three ovals here are showing summer peaks. So every summer, we find more of our courses use a higher percentage of the tools, which is interesting. Or rather, I should say, a higher percentage of courses are using each of these tools, uh, which corresponds generally to, I think, summer courses being more compressed, as well as being more blended, right? Augmenting maybe a traditional face-to-face -face classroom with more digital tools. And then to the, the right in the fall of 2015, we saw a pretty significant spike in use for a lot of our tools. And again, we attribute that to, that was when the, the print quota went into effect, so students were no longer uh, being able to print unlimited for free. And so we saw similarly that um, increase in the adoption of electronic tools in order to uh, prevent students from having to pay to print materials or submit their assignments. But at least for me as kind of a data geek, fascinating trends to see. At the same time that we did that analysis on tools, we surveyed anyone who was teaching with Blackboard. So that included faculty, instructors, and teaching assistants. So anyone who was the instructor of record for a course, in essence and found overall that 82% of faculty were confident using Blackboard, which was great to hear. Um, a smaller percentage felt that Blackboard was easy to use, 
but uh, overall felt that Blackboard does increase teaching efficiency, which is uh, one of the hopeful outcomes that we, want, we would expect from adoption of a tool like this. So moving from Blackboard overall into this most recent upgrade, um, compared to years past, this was not uh, did not have significant changes, I think, that are visible to you and to your students. But this particular uh, upgrade process had a heavy toll and a lot of changes behind the scenes that uh, you will benefit from but never actually see. Primarily, what I'm talking about here is we moved from being self-hosted, meaning that Blackboard was installed on servers that were here on campus, to Blackboard's cloud hosting platform. So Blackboard calls this SaaS. It's actually, it's not a Blackboard term. It's an industry term for software as a service. But you'll see, uh, if you look into any of Blackboard's documentation or, or their, um, what they've posted and publicized about their offerings, that's what we are on now, uh, Blackboard SaaS. So it is hosted on Amazon Web Service, uh, just like, well, nearly all of the internet these days, it seems, uh, and most cloud-based applications and software programs are housed in AWS. So what this will let us do is really take advantage of more modern hosting infrastructure that um, you were accustomed to on a lot of other services. So in the future, when we um, have a Blackboard, uh, an update or an upgrade, it should occur uh, without any outage. So instead of taking Blackboard down for a day or two, or in this last case, we had 10 days where Blackboard was affected, uh, we would only have, um, it would happen in the background without anyone being aware that that update was occurring. Uh, as well, that gives us the ability to have our Blackboard instance be more scalable. So in, again, in the past, we had a finite limited number of servers. We had actually four physical servers and four virtual servers, but we were capped at that capacity. So if more students logged into Blackboard, there was, there was nothing that we could do to accommodate extra traffic. Now, generally speaking, we had um, plenty of, of capacity but we had um, no ability to grow that. So um, I just saw Arlene, you mentioned I have an echo. Let me. So I did a quick audio check and returned, uh, resubmitted. Could you verify? And let me do another quick poll to see who is, who is hearing an echo. Is anyone hearing an echo still on my audio? So yes, if you're hearing echo, no, if you are not. Let me keep an eye here. Um, so it looks like Josephine's hearing an echo, but no one else is. Josephine, I also see that you're logged into Black to the session twice. So you may want to, let me, in fact, I'll, is it okay if I remove the, the duplicate of you from the session? has gone inactive anyhow. Okay, so it looks like we're doing better. Thanks, Corbin, for um, letting me know about the lag. Excellent, okay. I think we're doing okay. And again, just like Arlene did, let me know if you see any issues. I've also turned off my camera, and I think I'll leave that off for right now since there was an issue. Uh, so we're talking about the, the benefits here of cloud hosting. The, the third benefit to highlight is we are, we're now on Blackboard's delivery model called continuous delivery. They have two options. One is flexible deployment. That would have two uh, significant updates each year, which is similar to our old update model. But instead, we are on continuous delivery, which means that we get more frequent patches and bug fixes. So if something is an issue, Hopefully, we'll be able to have that resolved sooner than we would have been able to in the past, as well as we'll see a 
quicker cadence of new features becoming available and being delivered that will change the way that we um, <laughs> we inform you of those. So in the future, we won't have a big May update and then uh, information going out at about that time. But we you'll see, again, a more um, ongoing stream of information when there are new features that you may want to take advantage of. We will continue to not tell you about all of the patches installed and security fixes, since that would just be added clutter. Uh, but you can see all of that out on Blackboard's help site. The other reason, honestly, that we moved to the cloud hosting instead of keeping our, our self-hosted servers was we've been with Blackboard for a great, amount, great length of time. And while we have uh, added more servers, upgraded servers, replaced them over time, our current hardware was really at end of life. So we were faced as a university with the option of replacing those hard, those servers and having a few more years um, that we could then maintain them or moving to the cloud hosting. And so the cloud hosting was the far more economical choice for us at this point. It required more, uh, more staff time, but the, the cost of cloud hosting versus uh, purchasing and maintaining those servers longer term was a, a much better financial decision for us. So we are currently on version 3400.5.0, uh, which is Blackboard's newer way of keeping track. Generally, that's not going to matter because with the continuous delivery model, we will always be on the most recent delivery. So now on to the stuff that's maybe a little more exciting, and that are the, the new features that are available in Blackboard. So as a reminder, you can always find the information on our upgrades at niu.edu slash blackboard slash upgrade. For those of you who are here live, I'll put that link into the text chat for you. So you can click that and go straight to it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more detail about some of these features. But you can always find out more about timelines when we were doing these big upgrades or uh, about new features. We will probably have to repurpose this page going forward in order to accommodate our new, um, new delivery structure where we aren't doing these big annual upgrades. But for now, that's a great source of information for you. So if we look back at uh, last year, our 2017 upgrade included some um, features that were already available, like the improved course request process that delivers your course to you instantaneously as opposed to taking 24 hours, and the redesigned Blackboard app for students to use on their phones, as well as new features, including a new theme that was mobile responsive, so it looked and felt different than it had in the past, some uh, improved behavior for self and peer assessments so that students who did not participate in the initial uh, submission process were not included in the evaluation process, as well as smaller enhancements like adding a drag and drop file upload option, uh, assignment submission receipts, and some changes to the, uh, or oh, in the upcoming at that time, Blackboard Instructor mobile app, which is now available. Uh, campus-wide. This year, we have a shorter list of new features, but I also want to highlight a few things that are upcoming in a very short time frame, um, or a longer time frame. We'll see how what our implementation plans look like, but some of these will be available now, some will be available soon, and some will be available eventually. So our first new feature that you should have noticed now is single sign-on. Uh, this is actually the screen that you see now when you log out of Blackboard. So I guess this is the sign off, not the sign on. But single sign-on is a convenience and security uh, improvement for you. So if you are logged into um, Office 365 already, say you are checking your email or collaborating on a document, when you log into Blackboard, you will automatically be logged in based on your credentials that are already logged in for Office 365. 
This is built on an Azure AD platform for anyone who wants those technical details, which is the authentication framework that the university at large is trying to move toward. It's more secure than, and easier to maintain than some of what we've been doing before. What this means for you is when you do sign out of Blackboard, you can sign out of Blackboard locally, but that will still leave your, essentially your single sign-on session active. So if you are completely done with your email and your uh, and Blackboard, when you sign out of Blackboard, you'll also have the option to end your single sign-on session. If you don't end your session, you or someone else could go back to Blackboard, click log in, and automatically be taken to your Blackboard um, space without having to provide a password. So do be cautious if you're using a shared computer uh, that when you log out of Blackboard, you also end your SSO session so that no one else can access your, your Blackboard or your, your email and your OneDrive spaces. Uh, so while overall this is a, an enhancement and it's a better convenience, it does, as I said, have some security implications you need to be cautious about. We'll hopefully see over the next year and so more uh, services joining into the SSO platform. Um, I know they're actively working on, say, MyNIU or Qualtrics and a few of the other uh, products that we use across NIU. The most exciting new feature that was added to Blackboard, though, I think is the attendance tracker. So this allows you to keep track of attendance in your course without creating a, an individual column in the Grade Center for every class session that you had. So essentially, this is almost like a spreadsheet within a spreadsheet. The attendance tracker is available under Course Tools in your control panel. When you open it, you'll be asked initially to configure the attendance tracker. So there are three options, well, four options when you're taking attendance. You can mark someone as present, late, absent, or excused. And when you're marking someone as late, uh, Blackboard wants to know how much credit, essentially, that student's going to earn for it. So if they're present, they would get 100% of the credit. If they're absent, they would get 0% of the credit. And then based on your course policies, you can determine whether if you marked someone late, does that mean they get 50% or 75% or 100% of the credit? Maybe you're just marking them late to keep track, but your attendance policy states that they still get full credit. That's up to you to determine. You could also simply never use the, the late uh, designation if that's not, again, something that's part of your attendance policy. Uh, by default, Blackboard takes you into marking attendance for today's class session. And you can, with one click, well, two clicks, I guess, mark everyone as present. And then you can also override individual students once you've done that to indicate who is late, absent, or excused. The attendance tracker then automatically calculates an overall grade for students based on their attendance record. This is the overall view as opposed to the individual meeting view. And I like this because it includes some basic information across the top, such as the current average attendance grade, how many students have perfect attendance, how many students are average or above average, and how many students perhaps are um, really potentially in some trouble based on their attendance record. These might be students who you would want to follow up with in order to uh, make sure that everything's okay and that they're on track. From this view, you can also add past class sessions. So if you moused in between the columns here, there'd be a small plus where you could add another column in between those two dates. And then you can also, for an older date, mark everyone as present, absent, or exempt. And then you can also see an individual student view if you click on their name from the overall view. So here for this uh, fake student, I can see their overall score, a summary of their attendance, 
and then the specific attendance for each day that they either attended or did not. And I can override those as well from this view. The attendance tracker overall is a really simplistic tool. Um, there are plans to further enhance this down the road, such as potentially adding the ability for students to check in from their mobile device into the attendance tool. Right now, it assumes that you are going to either uh, call out role or mark students attended based on uh, observation of the room or pass around a, a sign-in sheet of some sort in order to enter that attendance record later. So it, it doesn't have any cool integrations like say a, a student response system or clicker would right now, uh, but the possibility is there that that will be an enhancement down the road. Another uh, really simple enhancement that I think is going to make a huge difference for you is being able to easily check and change the course availability. So now in the upper right corner of Blackboard, next to the edit mode, and actually because um, the, the themes are no longer available, this is a, a weird mishmash of a screenshot, um, you'll see the student preview and then the lock icon here and then edit mode. And this lock, lets you, first of all, visually determine whether the course is available or not. So here with the lock open, it's showing that the course is available. If the lock were closed and uh, also red, then you would know that the course was unavailable. And if you click on that lock, you can toggle the course available or unavailable uh, from right from the, the main content view of your course. So instead of going into your uh, customization and personalization features in order to get to the page with availability, you can do that right from uh, the, the home page of your course even. Another small enhancement adds on to the submission receipts that students receive when they submit an assignment. So with our upgrade last year, uh, we gained the feature so that students get a submission confirmation number that's visible here. And it was visible to students once they submitted their assignment. However, this enhancement will also send the students an email confirmation. So once they have submitted their assignment in Blackboard, they'll get the confirmation receipt number in Blackboard, as well as get that confirmation receipt number in their email to confirm that they're assignment was submitted. You'll also have, uh, you already have this, but just if you're not aware, in Blackboard, from the full grade center, you can access a submission receipt report. And so it's under reports. This will let you see all of the submission and confirmation numbers for all of the students who have submitted something in class. If there was ever a doubt from a student as to whether or not their assignment was submitted, you can check here to see if they had a confirmation receipt. And then it's hidden the way that I've staggered these, but there's an ability to search. So you can search by student or by ZID in order to find all of the submissions for a single student. You'll also note here this group outline that has three rows was submitted as part of a group assignment. So Chris Casper here was the uh, the pseudo student who submitted that group outline on behalf of his group and you can see the other students Bruce and Sarah who are a member of his group also have a submission receipt recorded for that group assignment. With a group assignment only one student needs to submit it and it looks as though it's submitted on behalf of all of the members of that group. Dawn, that lock feature should be available in your courses. Um, I have noticed that there are some pages that it's not visible on for whatever reason. Um, so for example, the, the module page, that ho uh, home page, it is visible. But if your home page is the announcements, it's probably not visible there. I would switch to um, one of the content pages of your course. Like um, if you have content or 
assessments or information, it should be visible on one of those pages. I'm not sure why it's not available on the announcement feature. We've, we and other schools have already given that back to Blackboard as feedback that it should have been persistent across all of the pages. But I would check a different page in your course and see if you find it there. Another, again, small enhancement, but one that I think also has some big impact is to the discussion board. So on the discussion board, there's a new reply to me notification feature so that you can, you and your students can more easily keep track of conversations that involve you as opposed to looking at all of the threads from everyone in the class. So right now I'm at the, the top level discussion board view. Uh, where I can see each of the individual discussions for this course. And I can see that out of, for this unit one astronomy overview, out of 20 posts, there are 10 that I haven't read, but there are four that are replies to me. So if I click that, um, that indicator, it will take me to a listing of just the replies that were made to either my initial post or perhaps a reply I had posted to somewhere else so that I can see how that conversation has evolved and continue to contribute. This carries through to the thread level, so you can see within a thread how many replies there are that were to replies to you, again, so that you can more easily find those conversations that you've already joined and keep them going. So again, a small change, but one that uh, I think will make it more uh, the discussion board more participatory and more effective for you and your students. Again, a small change, but one that uh, I have heard lots of times that people want is the ability to clean up your grade center by removing columns that you no longer need. So you can do that. If the column is connected to an assessment, you have to delete the actual assessment whether that's an assignment or a graded discussion board or a test. Um, as some examples, there are other types of assessments. But uh, you couldn't, if you had created a column manually or the column was orphaned from an assignment, uh, you would have to delete them one at a time. And that's, that's time consuming and unnecessary. So now with this new um, feature, if you go to the column organization, then you can more quickly delete columns. So you would click the checkbox for any of the columns you wanted to delete, and then click the delete button, and then submit your changes. What that will do is one of two things. If it was a manually created column, Blackboard will delete the column entirely. That includes, by the way, deleting any grades that were in that column. So be very cautious about using this bulk delete feature because you can delete accidentally grades that you had entered for students. If that column is connected to another assessment, again, an assignment, a test, a discussion board, a blog or wiki or journal, um, then Blackboard will delete the grades out of that column, but it will not be able to delete the column still because it's connected to that other assessment. So again, I caution using this. It's here, it's a great feature, but be careful that you really do want to delete that column. Now, when you click delete, Blackboard will prompt you, are you sure you want to delete this? Are you sure? Um, but it's always um, a, the best approach to make sure you want to delete the column and double and triple check before you try to delete it. You can also always download the Grade Center to work offline. That will give you an Excel spreadsheet that you can use as a backup. Then go and delete columns uh, in case you delete something that you maybe needed to have kept. You'll have the Excel spreadsheet and you can always re-upload that into Blackboard in order to recover anything you removed. And then another small enhancement to the Grade Center is that now Grade Center columns are going to display the full name of the column as opposed to 
cutting off the column early. So if you had really long assignment titles, you'll be able to read the entire title instead of only seeing discussion board assignment one and having it be like discussion b and not be able to see which, you know, is this one or two or seven. Um, now the other flip side is if you have really long column names, this header is going to get longer in order to accommodate that. So you may find that if you had long column names that now your column headers are actually, you know, this long instead of just being a small column header. So do take a look at your, your grade center and determine uh, when you, for your next course, the next time you're teaching the course, if you do need to change any of those, you can still override them using the grade center name um, as to override what the actual assignment title was. I have seen some really long, strange assignment titles in my time. So either way though, easier, to keep track of which column is which, which I appreciate. And it sounds like Matt does too. <laughs> so that's really it. Not a whole lot of crazy changes um, because there just weren't a lot of new things this time. I think the assignment tracker will be the most exciting one to, to jump into, uh, or the attendance tracker rather is the most exciting one. And then I, I really like seeing the full grade center column names like Matt does. And I like that lock, being able to get in and check my course availability so quickly. Kelly says, you cannot arrow to the right at the bottom of the grade book and still see the headers. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, the On my view, the grade center column headers are um, are still locked at the top of the screen. So if I've scrolled all the way to the bottom or I scroll over, I still see them. I would suggest follow up with me later and we'll see what's going on with your view because they should still be there um, even when you've scrolled down. We'll have to play around with that and see what's going on for you. Any other questions about any of the new features before I move on? Okay, Kelly, it sounds like that's a, an issue with the screen size. Um, I also noticed, by the way, if you make your browser window smaller now, so it's more of a, a tablet size, Blackboard will automatically collapse the left navigation menu. You can open it back up by clicking the blue bar that's over there to the right, or over to the left, rather. Um, but that's something else to keep in mind that may affect being able to um, scroll across the column headers. Uh, Arlene, this recording, I will have it posted and I will send it out to you directly. Excellent question. Okay, so upcoming features. New things that you haven't uh, seen yet, that aren't available yet, but are essentially on the roadmap for Blackboard. Um, or on the roadmap for us as an institution. So the first one is the Blackboard Instructor mobile app. So the app already exists, but the roadmap for it includes some really exciting grading features. So for the first iteration of the app, Blackboard focused on helping faculty be able to access their courses and their content and uh, some of the communication tools that are needed here in the, uh, for everyone to be able to use in Blackboard. Phase, the, the next phase planned for release in July is the first phase of mobile grading. So this is going to be optimized for a tablet just because you have a little more screen real estate. But as far as I know, will also be available on a phone. Um, I don't have any details on how much would or wouldn't be right now. We'll have to wait for more information. But the grading workflows will allow you to see uh, what's been submitted, grade them with a rubric, add comments and annotations to the 
students' assignments directly on your mobile device. It also had what, in the, the mock-ups I've seen, some really neat uh, analysis tools to see students' overall performance on the assignment, as well as, uh, from the mobile view, uh, a draft feature where you can grade the assignment but then not submit the grades and post them until you're ready to maybe do a bulk post of all of the students' grades back. So from a, again, from thinking about a mobile workflow as opposed to a desktop workflow, if you have your phone and you are um, maybe at, you know, a, a, your kid's soccer practice and you can grade a few students while you're waiting, then um, you can wait to submit those until you've gone through all of the students, kind of sneaking those little moments of time to be able to grade. Looking further ahead, uh, maybe later this year, then Blackboard plans to add more advanced grading opportunities, such as multimedia feedback, um, being able to grade offline, grading anonymously, as well as a few other features. We'll see that come as an update to the app later this year, but so far what we have heard is this July there'll be an update to the app for um, that will add this grading feature into it. So Dawn, what's the exact name of the current Blackboard mobile app? So there are two apps. One is just simply called Blackboard. That one is designed for students to use. And then there's a second app called Blackboard Instructor that's intended for faculty to use for their teaching. So depending on your, your role or usage, you may need one or both. But the, the exact name of the app that includes grading, or will, will include grading, is called Blackboard Instructor. So hopefully that helps you find it. Uh, as I said, they, the, the one for students is simply called Blackboard. And I encourage you to share that information with your students so that they can find the app as well and keep up with our courses on the go. So then the last upcoming feature that I just want to kind of sneak peek here is Blackboard Ultra. So Black Ultra is the code name, brand name, uh, depends on how you want to look at it, for Blackboard's completely redesigned um, LMS. It features more modern design with more intuitive controls, easier for both you and your students to use. And like many of our, the, the software that we use today, does more work, instead of providing us with all of the tools that are available, does more work to be able to highlight and promote and help you access quickly the most important information or tools that you'll need to use. Um, we are not on Ultra now, and we don't have a timeline for when we're going to or if we're going to adopt Ultra, but I wanted to take a minute and just um, feature of some of the, the look and feel of Ultra and the way that it changes the, the teaching and learning um, process uh, since we have extra time today and it is sort of in the the future of what's new with Blackboard. So one of the the first things that um, is important about Ultra as I said is that it it highlights more um, see more prominently those changes or um, tasks or updates that are important in all of your courses. So for example, here, this activity stream brings in due dates, announcements, new content, new messages that are available in any of your Blackboard courses. Uh, this holds true for you as well as for your students. So logging into Blackboard and coming into this activity stream can help you more easily identify what you need to be working on as well as what um, how to prioritize your time and your usage of Blackboard. This is part of what Blackboard would term the Blackboard experience or the base navigation. This is outside of an individual course view. Uh, 
speaking of accessing courses, the current course list for yourself looks a little bit different. Um, instead of having the module with just a list of those courses, you can see the, the courses and filter them and search them in a more meaningful way. They are divided by term, both past courses, which this parent individual didn't have, current courses and upcoming courses. And then you can highlight or star favorite courses that you access more often so that they stay at the top of your course list. This view is, um, like I said, outside of any given course. And so this would be, like I said, the, the ultra base navigation in essence. It would replace the, the tabs across the top of Blackboard with basically tabs on the left side of Blackboard <laughs> of your, mon your browser. And instead of having the complex page of individual module boxes, you'd have a more simplified activity stream course and organization list. One thing before we go and look at what a course looks like in Ultra, I want to point out that this base navigation piece uh, would cover all of Blackboard. Everyone would see that. But you would have a choice going forward about keeping the original course view that we have now or moving to the Ultra course view. So we will be, before we would turn this on for everyone, we would do a, a pilot with some faculty. If you think you might be interested, shoot me an email because I would love to um, hear from you and get you some early access so that you can try out Ultra as a sandbox maybe and see if it will, will meet your needs and if you want to try it out further. But in the meantime, this isn't a, a full like LMS switch. We're not pulling the rug out from everyone that now every, you know, suddenly you're into this whole new ecosystem. Um, it would be a gradual process, but I think there's some really exciting things that we can show you. So this is what a course looks like in Ultra. Um, notice that there is no course menu. Everything is uh, more visible and more, um, more easily accessed. So now that we've looked at it kind of as a base view, let me clutter it up with some callouts. So at the top here, what we're seeing is the course, the navigation bar. It highlights uh, and makes it easier for you to access frequently used tools like the calendar or uh, so the, the calendar icon, the messages, as well as assessments and uh, email so that you can more easily contact people in your, your students and your students can keep up on what goes on in their course. You can add content in a number of ways. One of my favorites is this new plus icon that lets you contextually add content anywhere within the course, as opposed to currently how Blackboard always puts it at the bottom and then you have to drag it back in place. This plus it would be available at each of these uh, divisions between all of the content. So you can put your content exactly where you want it. Over to the left, this details and actions area has tools for you to manage your course as well as for students to keep up with the course. For example, this course room is the Blackboard Collaborate uh, course room so that students can more easily join uh, the, the Collaborate session to be able to attend a, a live online class. And you can see that lock carries over here so you can also see when your course is available or unavailable. And then in the middle here in this course content area, you can organize your content in folders, but notice that there is no course menu with multiple content areas. So it's easier for students to see and find the content in their course. Here's another view of adding content. So again, I mentioned that plus that can appear anywhere. And then when you're creating that content, you can create it directly in the text editor. You can upload content um, from a file. You can also copy content directly from another course. So instead of using a full course copy, you can more granularly pull in pieces of content from other courses. And then again, talking about ease and simplicity, to make 
something available or hide it, you actually click where it would say here, it says visible to students. You can click that indicator in order to choose to hide it from students or to use conditional availability, which is essentially what right now is called adaptive release. But conditional availability is a little bit better term. It makes more sense, I think, than adaptive release does. So this is where you can set specific dates for things to become available or other rules based on you know, completion of an assignment or something like that. One of the, the most exciting changes in Ultra is really enabling better connections between you and your students and between students. So one optional feature that you can add to any content or assessment is a conversation. So this is different from a full discussion a conversation is just a place where students can contextually ask questions about that item. So for example, this was a lecture. So this is a piece of content. And with the, con the conversation enabled, then students can ask questions and the professor can respond uh, directly related to that piece of content instead of separating it out into another discussion board. This conversations feature is optional. So when you create content or you create an assessment, you also determine whether or not you want to have a conversation enabled. So you could use it. You can also choose to never use it. But it creates, again, more opportunity for conversation and discussion. Speaking of discussions themselves, the, the discussion tool itself is somewhat different, but not a whole lot different. But the coolest thing is that, collabor uh, that Blackboard Ultra has more analytics and analysis tools. So for example, for my overall discussion forum, this is the questions and answers forum, I can see an some base analysis on the number of students who have participated, how long their posts were. I can see who has not participated. I can see who had the most replies. So which threads were the most popular, essentially? And I can see who the top participants were, who posted the most and had the most activity. I can also dig in on a, a this is a more formal discussion to the right, uh, a particular student's analysis. So here's their um, discussion post. And Blackboard offers some base analysis of that post to assist with grading. So it, based on um, industry norms for uh, textual analysis, it can tell me what the critical thinking level might be or the complexity level, the readability level. Um, and then from there, also summarizes how many responses the student made. In other words, how many posts they made, how many replies they made to other students, and what their word count was across those posts. So it's not obviously telling me how to grade this student, but it is giving me some more insight into how that student participated and what the level of participation was like. So that's everything I wanted to show you today about Ultra. There's obviously so much more available, but that gives you just a little peek into what that might look like and um, what might be available and how that might transform your teaching. Um, like I said, we have no we have no timeline or plans around uh, when we would be piloting it or looking at it more closely. But I welcome any any thoughts or feedback you might have about it um, because it is going to be. I think it, it has a great deal of um, applicability in a lot of ways that it can really transform our teaching. But at the same time, it's not for everyone. And it doesn't have to be. So anyhow, I hope you enjoyed that little peek and preview for something that um, will be available here at, at some point in the future. Again, for any specific information about this most recent release, um, go to niu.edu slash blackboard slash upgrade in order to check that out. Otherwise, um, I welcome any other questions you might have. You can contact me as well after the, the session's over. 
um, and I will try to address those then as well. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you at another session.